Okay, good morning. <laughs> it's 3 a.m. where I live. Okay, it's, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not even thinking about going to bed yet. The, um, so um, before I even start the thing, we teach a bunch of different classes at Stanford. One of them is called Designing Your Stanford. We redesigned Designing Your Life to Designing Your Stanford, how to go to college, how to learn to go to college like a designer. And we said there are three core practices of the designerly-minded student. Um, and they are ERS, engage, reflect, and storytell. If you really get it, the habit of living in a designerly way as a student when you're trying to inhale the world as best you possibly can is do stuff, engage, reflect, like what happened? Actually learn from what happened to you. Don't just do stuff and keep going. And then storytell. Take what you experience and talk to other people about it, which if you talk about other things in an interesting way that you've reflected upon, starts the virtuous cycle of getting invited to more engagements and on you go, lather, rinse, and repeat. So we're gonna do that right now. So Rick just said some really, really cool things. By the way, how many of you are thrilled with the fact that you get to hang out with and work with an organization led by a guy like that? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, my guess is people here are involved in more than one educational institution. They don't all talk like that, okay? And, the, and the, you know, uh, so I think I'm really pleased to be here. So um, I want you to think up, to, I want you, we're gonna do, you're just to engage, you'll listen to Rick. You're going to do two reflections right now. I'm going to give you 20 seconds to come up with two things. Number one, what most got your attention that Rick said? What most got your attention was most interesting to you? Thing one. Thing two. What thing did Rick say? It might be the same thing. To which you'd like to reply, hmm, that's interesting. Tell me more. Tell me more. So what got your attention about what would you say? Tell me more. Okay? You have 10 seconds to come up with those. Go. What's interesting? Tell me more. There will be a test. Three, two, one. Great. Reflections over. We're going to story tell now. Stand up and tell somebody one of those two things you just thought of. Okay, say thank you and have a seat. You're done. We'll do more. So, um, just because I need to acknowledge him, so this is, this is Bill, uh, my, my partner in crime, <clears throat> who's the executive director of the design program at Stanford, and we together work and founded this thing we call the Life Design Lab at Stanford. So what is that all about? <laughs> well, first of all, this is not fully a lecture, it's not entirely a lecture. I will be, because I was asked to be lecturing a little bit more than I normally do in design. We tend to do stuff more than talk about it. Um, so. <clears throat> It's an interactive workshop. You're going to be writing some things, talking to one another a little bit, just a little tiny bit. You know, it's kind of like the taste test thing. There's little things they have at Costco. You know, it gets a, just a little bite. You don't get the whole meal today, uh, but we're going to give you a couple of bites. Keep that in mind. Now, <clears throat> we teach designing your life to Stanford juniors and seniors. We teach designing your Stanford to freshmen and sophomores. We teach designing the professional to PhDs. Um, which, by the way, even though Paulina Sarah Donatella, one of our former PhD students, um, designing the professional is really almost exactly the same as designing your life, but you're getting a PhD, so you get a bigger word. Um, so, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that are pretty much. And we teach about, fit, depending on the quarter, 13 to 20, about 15% of all the students at Stanford take one of the classes we teach. Now, why? Why is that? Well, these are smart kids. I and mean, what do they need to take a, a class on figuring themselves out, right? I mean, th these guys have got it all figured out. Well, maybe, maybe not. So let's go do some user-centered design. By the way, am I talking too fast? Good, because I'm not going to slow down. The, um, <laughs> when I sleep less, it speeds up. It's kind of scary. Um, so if you ask Stanford students, um, how's it going? You know, this is what life's they tell good. Life's great. Life is awesome. Amazing. <laughs> life's going well. So happy, cheerful Stanford students, you know, kind of like at Olin. They're having a good time. They like to be there. Let's raise the bar a little bit. Now, you know, what do you think about doing after you graduate? I should point out, by the way, these videos were taken at a career fair. It's really important to keep this in mind when you listen to these very insightful answers. The little name tags, you know, my name is Anna, I have a degree in anthropology, I'm unemployed, please save me, that kind of thing. You know, that's, <clears throat> that's what's going on there. Yeah, that'll be interesting. I was gonna go to med school, but some grades changed that. I think I'm gonna go to law school. <laughs> listen, listen. Um, um, ooh, uh, 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 I, 
my favorite, right there. I have no idea. I don't know yet. I have no idea what I'm going to do after college. Sometimes, I guess, I tell myself I don't really have to worry about it when I really probably should be. Okay, at a career fair. All prepped and ready to go. What do you want to do? Okay, now, we did not wait all day long for the eight clueless kids at Stanford to make them look bad. This took about 10 minutes. It's not hard. Uh, now, what's going on there? Well, <clears throat> okay, that's why we formed the, the Deal Life Lab, or the Life Design Lab, where our mission is to apply the innovation principles of design thinking to the wicked problem of designing your life at and after university. Now, the colored words we can double click on, get your white papers, that sounds nice and pedagogical. Most people go, I'm not really sure exactly what that means. It sounds good, it sounds very academic. What's it really mean? It really means we're the guys that teach the class that help you figure out what you want to be when you grow up. And when we say it that way, everybody goes, ooh, can I take the class? You know, uh, we've been saying that for a long, long time. <laughs> Actually, Jim Plummer, or Jim, <clears throat> our recently former dean of engineering, um, Sherry Shepard told me that when she was talking to you the first time you learned about designing your life, you said, can I take the class? Is that true? <laughs> okay, good, good, good. <laughs> that means it's not, but he's making me look good. Okay, so um, I've been saying that for years. I thought I'd check to see if it was true. The... Um, <laughs> And that's actually why we wrote the book. What it really means is we're the ones who help you keep figuring out what you want to become next. By the way, even in this August group, how many of you want to be all done growing up? Yeah, like what's that about? You know, uh, no, this, even the framing of the question is a bad idea. So that's what we do for a living is we work on this problem. Um, now, again, Interestingly enough, when we have, for the last 10 years, I'm starting my 11th year at Stanford, talk about what we do as helping people figure this question out a little bit, everybody seems to be interested in that problem. Um, <clears throat> now, what's that all about? Not to talk about sales figures, but I mean, I, for two years, successfully resisted the pressure from Bill to write this dumb book uh, because I thought, you know, nobody buys books anymore. Books just don't change lives. And there's too many books on this topic anyway. It won't work. It's a waste of our time. And I was overridden eventually. Um, <clears throat> and now the book has done astonishingly well, which completely surprised me, so I look bad. But I mean, so lots of people. We're in our 13th printing in one year, um, which com even the publisher whose expectations were really high has been surprised. You know, about a quarter million people are reading this book right now. Um, why is that? You know, why, why, why is everybody asking this question? Well, we think the reason is because people are stuck. Um, and uh, no cows were harmed in the making of a slide. The, um, you know, and people are stuck because, of, well, for one reason, of what we call dysfunctional beliefs, actually a term we borrowed from some people in organizational psychology, you know, ideas that are either just flat untrue or really not terribly helpful um, in terms of getting you forward in a generative way. So a couple of examples, particularly from an ed educational point of view. Now, first of all, do you all recall, how many of you went to college? I'm expecting a high group, okay, right. So now, you remember way back whenever you were probably 17, 18, if you're educated in this country, some of you were educated in different systems, a little different, but at the end of high school or gymnasium or whatever it was where you went, you know, and you're now going to go to university and you got into college, and, oh, I'm so excited, I feel, yay, I'm going to college. You know, um, what did the grown-ups start saying to you? What did you, what did you hear the grown-ups saying right after you got into college? Do you remember? What do you want to major in? What do you want to be? Anybody else remember what you heard? Anybody talk to adults at the time? Okay. <clears throat> do, you, do you remember, is there a sense of this is going to be a good time? Oh, yeah, and heard that. these are the best years of your, who heard that? These are the best years of your life, right? And then you go, oh, that's so exciting. And then very quickly an image forms in your mind, looks kind of like this, you know? Um, and you're suddenly like, oh, my God, you know? Now, you th I, I used to think this was, this, the best years of your life was a cultural idiom, you know, of America, or maybe even just the coastal states. I've now tested this literally around the world. You know, I was with a group of students in Beijing. They're going to go, yes, yes, they all say that to us, you know? Um, and, it's, and this f forms in the mind. So, and, and by the way, I will tell, I, and when we, we present, present this to our students, they go, yeah, totally, you know, and it terrifies us. Um, because who says this? The people way over here, you know, 40, 50, they're 80. You know, I've been on the downhill slide for 60 years. Trust me, I know. <laughs> I'd give anything to be 19 again, right? I mean, you know, which is a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. You couldn't, I mean, really, I mean, I know some of you, we'd all probably like to be as fast and thin as we were when we were 20, but not, how many of you really would rather be your 20-year-old self than the person you are today? Yeah, talk to me after class, okay. The, um, <laughs> 
So, uh, so, and, 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 so that, that point of view is terrible. It's a ridiculous point of view. Now, here's another thing we use sometimes. Um, Alan Watts, who's no longer with us, but a very interesting British guy, one of the first people to bring Eastern thinking into the West, and we're not selling a particular worldview here per se, but there's an interesting little model he has about what education really is, since we're talking about educational paradigms, you know, and it was illustrated by the South Park guys who you didn't know were into educational reform. Um, and so he says some interesting things here. It's kind of cute. In music, though, one doesn't make the end of a composition the point of the composition. If that were so, the best conductors would be those who played faster. And there would be composers who wrote only finales. <laughs> People go to a concert just to hear one crashing chord, because that's the end. <laughs> now, but we don't see that as something brought by our education into our everyday conduct. We've got a system of schooling which gives a completely different impression. It's all graded. And what we do is we put the child into the corridor of this grade system with a kind of, come on, kitty, kitty, kitty. And yeah, you go to kindergarten, you know, and that's a great thing because when you finish that, you'll get into first grade. And then, come on, first grade leads to second grade, and so on, and then you get out of grade school, you've got high school, and it's revving up, the thing is coming, then you're going to go to college, and by Jove, then you get into graduate school, and when you're through with graduate school, you go out to join the world. And then you get into some racket where you're selling insurance, and they've got that quota to make, and you're going to make that, and all the time, the thing is coming. It's coming, it's coming, that great thing, the, the success you're working for. Then when you wake up one day about 40 years old, you say, my God, I've arrived. <laughs> I'm there. And you don't feel very different from what you always felt. And there's a slight letdown because you feel there's a hoax. And there was a hoax, a dreadful hoax. They made you miss everything. We thought of life by analogy with a journey with a pilgrimage, which had a serious purpose at the end, and the thing was to get to that end, success or whatever it is, or maybe heaven after you're dead. But we missed the point the whole way along. It was a musical thing, and you were supposed to sing or to dance while the music was being played. Well, the point is not necessarily to affirm his conclusion, but the point being that, you know, we're, we really try to help our students understand where are you coming from? What ideas did they give you? Do you believe in the point of view that you currently hold or not? Have you even stopped long enough to think about it? You know, so, so dysfunctional, we're talking about what are the dysfunctional beliefs that get people stuck? You know, a bunch of things that orient you to what is college even about? Put one foot in the bucket before you even start. You know, but wait, we're, you know, <laughs> there's more, you know. So can, you know, can we talk? These are terrible ways to talk to people, you know. So <clears throat> what were they thinking? So by the way, hopefully none of you will ever say these are the best years of your life again as long as you live. Do not say that to 18-year-olds. It sets them up for terrible stress. Um, these are lovely years, but trust me, being, you know, you know I mean, I tell my students, how many of you heard when you got into college, gosh, you know, that's great, I remember college, you know, being a late teen, early 20s, it's a lovely, it's awfully stressful, but it's a very exciting time, you have a lovely, it's a dedicated, it's a unique time, you have no responsibilities, you're really, you know, free to do a variety of things, that's a lovely time, you know, but trust me, it gets a lot better, you know, our 20 was kind of cute, kind of interesting, but 64, 64 kicks butt, I love being 64, you know. You couldn't pay me to be you, but go ahead, have a good time, there's more. You know, um, <clears throat> and I said, how many students have heard that? Like none. How many you, w and here's the question. How many of you wish you heard that? Everybody raises their hand. Everybody raises their hand. This youth culture is ridiculous. You know, uh, <clears throat> let's, let's, let's grow forward. So change the way we think about that stuff. You know, dysfunctional belief number two, a couple of kids sitting around on the quad having a conversation they often do. Hey, what are you majoring in? Oh, I'm majoring in Sim Sis with a minor in creative writing. You all know the next question. What's, what are you going to do with that exactly? What are you going to do with that? Like, what is SimSys anyway? Um, because, of course, we all know your major determines your future. Eh, thanks for playing. No, it doesn't. The research makes very clear, depending on the study you look at, either five to ten years after college graduation, 80% of college graduates are working outside their field of undergraduate baccalaureate study, i.e., what you major in does not determine what you do. Stanford has 74 undergraduate majors. How many of you got, Rick? Three. We have three degrees. Are there more than three things that the 7.2 billion people in the world do? 
Yes, do the math. I mean, even 74. Like, you know, so the, the question, what do you major in, what will you do with that, presupposes that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between what you studied and who you are. That doesn't make any sense at all. It's stupid. OK, stop asking the question. What's your passion? The favorite number one curtain meta narrative directive question. Hi, how are you doing? What's your passion? Properly pronounced, what's your passion? What's your passion? Are you passionate? Is this really, are you sure you're doing, is this, is this it? Is this it? You're not missing it? Oh my God. Um, so that's a ridiculous question because our colleague Bill Damon at the Center for Adolescence, where they study people to the age of, right, 27. Um, <clears throat> why? Because that part of your judgment up in the prefrontal cortex, you know, the executive function doesn't fully bake until you're about 26 to 28, a little later in boys. Oh, what a surprise, okay. Um, <clears throat> so what's your passion? You know, so when Bill studies this stuff, the uh, purpose formation, passion formation, what he concludes is about two out of 10 people can answer the question, what's your passion, clearly and singularly. Eight out of 10 people answer it either, I don't know, or which one did you want to hear about first? Now, if it's I don't know or which one did you want to hear about first, and that's completely normal, where if you say the definitive question should, that should be the organizing principle for young lives applies to only two out of 10 people and treats eight out of 10 normal people as needing remediation, it's the wrong question. Number four, we got plenty. Um, you know, you should know by now. I mean, you're 19 for heaven's sakes. Haven't you got it all figured out, right? Um, how many of you right now would prefer to delegate the next decision you make to your 21-year-old self? <laughs> Not even she went, okay. See, so, no, but, you know, that's a terrible idea. Now, our friend George, this is George Valiant, who ran the Grant Study, one of the longest longitudinal studies ever done, begun in 1936. There's a whole bunch wrong with it because it's mostly white and male. By today's standards, it's not diverse at all. But nonetheless, the key findings are actually really interesting. So at the end of 40 or 50 years of doing this, George commented on the study and all the people in it, you know, and talked about things and had things to say, like, you know, youth is really wonderful, except, of course, for the miserable process of getting from 25 to 35. And these, by the way, the people in the study were World War II veteran type people. These are white male Harvard graduates who survived World War II, making the world safe for democracy. Um, and they said, between 25 and 35, when talking quietly behind the curtain to the guys with the white coats and the clipboards, you know, how is it really going? While they're being terrifically successful, by the way, that they're miserable. Because they're scared stiff that this isn't really what I had in mind. Is it not really going to work out? Is, you know, is this really going to be successful long term for me personally, as well as for the world or for my family? And it turns out, he said, everybody in the study, by 35, 40, or 50, figured it out and really came out okay. You know, <clears throat> so if you just wait, it'll probably work out. But you just don't know that at 30, I, at 30, you know, you really need to be encouraged, hang in there, you're, you're, you're getting there. Real adulthood is around the corner. We've known this for a century, and we still keep asking 20 year olds, have you got to figure it out yet? As opposed to, are you learning how to figure it out so that when your 28 year old self wants to make a decision, she's in good shape to do so? Are you growing the person you want to become, or have you become that person yet? The way we frame these questions matters. Life is not a problem to be solved. You're not an engineering equation to be, to, to be reduced. It's an adventure to be engaged. So let's build our way forward, not just answer our way forward, by designing our lives. So that, that's why we do what we do the way we do it. Now, at this point, I'm going to go really fast because you all know this stuff. Um, so the secret sauce is design thinking. If you were not people who knew design thinking or human-centered design, I'd do this more slowly. Um, but basically, one of the ways you can reframe design thinking, one, th we, one thing we happened onto is the best way to help people get it about what design thinking is, is to identify what it's not. There are lots of kinds of thinking. Engineering thinking is really good at solving problems where the equations are well-defined, the boundary conditions are well understood, and it's repeatable. We love engineering. I have two engineering degrees myself. We have business thinking where you optimize. You're never done, you're never right. Customers never love you enough. Competition's never defeated enough. Market share's never high enough. But in figures of merit, quantification, optimization mechanism, mechanisms can succeed. You can run business effectively. If we do research, start with a hypothesis, dependent, independent variables, an analytic system, you know, getting down to either a result or the critical question to which there is no answer. And if you make actual progress, on a question to which no one has had an answer to ever before in history, we give you a prize. We call it a PhD. 
Um, it's an actual creation of rigorous knowledge. That's what a PhD is supposed to be. It's a really effective way of doing things. All three of these are really effective forms of thinking. They're tools in the box, mostly for tame problems. And who knows the, the technical distinction between tame and wicked problems? That's a technical term. It was developed by urban planners back in the 70s at Cal. Um, and wicked problems, uh, there's the 10 attributes of a wicked problem in the long article, there's the six attributes of a wicked problem in the short article. Um, and what it boils down to, they're basically human problems. They're, they're basically, excuse me, they're technical problems that are well-defined, where the criteria are clear, you know, they're repeatable and so on, but there's a whole class of problems that don't obey those rules. They're called wicked problems that are messy, where the criteria are not known until you even have the answer. Once the answer is found, you can't repeat it again because it doesn't re reapply. I mean, you can't put Singapore in Cincinnati and expect it to work if you're an urban planner. And we call those, you know, <clears throat> wicked problems, things where you build your way forward, and design thinking is really good for that. It's just one way of thinking. It's, it's not the new religion. It's a technique. Now, what is design thinking? Real briefly, it's, it's two things. It's a set of mindsets, real life mindsets, and it's a set of a process steps. The mindsets are these, again very briefly, you know, we start with curiosity. Why? Because that's where the energy is, not necessarily where the most strategic thing or the riskiest thing or the most valuable thing or the most unknown thing, the most curious thing, because that's where the human energy is that we can draw on to keep the process going. We radically collaborate. That doesn't mean we do radical things. It means we radically listen. We tap into every single point of view available. We want to make sure we hear from all the experts before we get started at all, which will probably invite us to reframe things and think about it in a different way. We do so mindful of process. The most important mindfulness is to remember, when am I deferring judgment and when am I using judgment? When am I flaring? and going wide, and what am I focusing and going narrow? To kind of keep that in mind, and learning how to defer judgment and catch yourself in the act of doing it and holding it off is a crucial skill. And when in doubt, do something. We'd rather do it than think about it. We'd rather act than analyze. The process is this, these five steps. Caterpillar has been around for a long time. We started the design program at Stanford in 1963, I believe. Um, David Kelly, our senior tenure professor uh, in design, is the third generation guru of design at Stanford. He comes on the heels of Bob McKim, who really built the program, uh, who, and it got started by John Arnold years ago, actually from MIT, and John started it the way we start lots of things in Silicon Valley. He couldn't get approval, so he just printed his own letterhead and did it anyway. Um, so we just invented ourselves. Um, but we start with empathy, problem find before you problem solve. Rick has already mentioned that. Then you define where you're coming from. Then you have a whole bunch of ideas. Pick the ones that are really worth investing in a little bit. Prototype them over and over again. We'll talk more about that. And then finally test before you visit them on the real world. We always believe in and state more explicitly in life design, step zero, which is accept. You have to start from where you are. You cannot solve a problem you're not willing to have. A lot of people don't like their problem. That's not solvable. If you've got a problem with your problem, that's a problem. Um, so you gotta get over that. And particularly in life design, well, I don't, I really should be someplace else. Young man calls me named Tim, he says, Dave, I understand you can help me. You know, John said, you're a helpful guy. So that's very kind of John, but Tim, what's the problem? He says, I'm three years late. I said, no, you're not. And he goes, yeah, I am. So we argued for a year um, about whether or not Tim was here or late. Fortunately, at the end of the argument, I won. Otherwise, he's four years late and we're in real trouble. Um, but you know, you can't, you can't solve a problem you're not willing to have. Now, how do we actually design our course? What's the course framework, as we call it? We start with that design process, but you know, when you any process of course, any engineering mechanism is a metaphor, right? It's not a completely accurate description of reality. Newtonian physics works just fine in a certain context, you know, but it, of course, all metaphors run out of gas when you get to the boundary conditions. And design thinking, as originally conceived, when you're doing something as squishy as a life design, there are a couple of questions it doesn't answer entirely. So we had to augment it a little bit with a, the meaning-making layer and the discovery and support layer. The meaning-making layer includes your point of view, your work view, as we call it, and your worldview. What are the values that inform your answer to the question, is this working for me? When you wake up at three in the morning and you're running to the bathroom, you flip on the light and the person staring back at you from the mirror is asking the question, how did we get here? Or why are we doing this? You want to have a good answer for the question. You know, and that comes from that top layer. And then how you get there, how you figure that stuff out, you need a system in place, an infrastructure, an ecosystem to form, you know, continue forming that life you're trying to live, which is, you know, <clears throat> your personal practices for thinking this stuff through, how you discern and make decisions that you really feel good about, and who are the people around you holding that process up. So we inform all of that as best we can. And the class is a whole bunch of stuff 
looks like this. That's the, that's the syllabus right there. Um, literally, that's the syllabus of the class. Um, and we do exercises and, and <clears throat> around all that kind of stuff. Now, is it time for the taste test yet? Was, I mean, as lectures go, that was really long uh, for one of our classes. That was an awful lot of talking in one row. Yes, it's time to finally do that taste test thing. So, let me jump right into the curriculum of the class with no particular segue. Say, there's a, one of the questions we address is, where do I fit? Where should I be? Answering this, what kind of contribution do I want to make? And is this really where I want to be? But the, the place that this person's trying to get to is not a geographical place. It has to do with meaning and location. Am I in the place where meaning can happen for me? And it brings up a couple of issues. So in that framework, you know, what's my point of view? And how do I define my role in the world? You know, how do I answer those questions in terms of the place? Am I in the right place? Which means it's time for us to draw the impact map. So a different way of locating yourself than you've probably seen before. So let me describe this map because you're about to do one. Uh, go ahead and pass those out now, uh, Nancy. So you're all going to get a form. I'll explain to you what's happening on that form because you're going to fill it out. On the horizontal axis, we have the type of impact you make in the world. A couple of different types of impact. <clears throat> on one end, there's, I'm doing new stuff. I'm installing newness in the world. I'm bringing things to bear that weren't there before. I'm value adding in sort of an, uh, that's an offensive mentality. On, or I am fixing problems. I'm getting rid of bad stuff. I'm filling in potholes. I'm solving things. I'm getting rid of things. That's more of a defensive mindset. Or I am sustaining and upholding things that deserve to continue. We need all three of these. There's, there's no moral pro, uh, uh, preferable position here. We need to get rid of bad stuff, we need to install new stuff, we need to take care of good stuff. Different types of behavior. On the vertical axis, we have my point of impact. Where do I actually engage with the world? Near or far? By near, I'm talking, I wanna see the whites of their eyes. Uh, I might wanna be involved in solving poverty, but what I really wanna do is I wanna see the, the change of expression on your face when I put the soup in your bowl on the soup line. Or do I want to sit back and kind of go, yeah, that's the right way to say it when I'm writing the article about policy making in a windowless basement in the West Wing talking about what's going on in public policy you know, in, a, in a national department or working on a task force at the UN. That's all the way up at a far, I'm far away from the point of engagement. I'm doing this at the global level. Let me illustrate with some examples. And by the way, these are roles that locate on this map, not people. People are all over the place. So, for instance, let's say I'm an investment banking systems analyst. I'm working at the institutional level, the institution of the banking world, and I'm probably running things the way we always have. I'm getting really good at doing this private equity thing, getting really good at this capital management thing. That's what I'm doing. That's where I sit on the map. I'm at the Gates Foundation, and I'm the program manager for the Malaria Project. I'm trying to rid the planet of malaria. If I get all done, all, that, all we have is the same place, just no malaria. That's our global level remediation. <clears throat> I'm a brain surgeon. I'm a very, very sophisticated, high-level person who's in the absolute bottom left of, the, of, the, of the, the program. I'm working at the individual level, working on individual brains, remediating tumors. When I get done, if you're lucky, you're almost as good as you were before. I'm not making you any better uh, than you were. I'm just remediating that problem. And by the way, brain surgery is massively non-scalable. It's one of the areas that's not particularly robotic yet. You know, it takes a long time to make a brain surgeon. They do like one surgery, you know, at a time, a couple a day at the most. You know, it's really a very inefficient industry. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a homeless center chef uh, who actually cooks in the kitchen for our homeless center, and I train our residents to become chefs while we do that. So I'm, I'm working at the group level. I'm working maybe in a town, uh, dealing with dozens of people at the most, you know, making them a little bit better, you know, on their way back to where they deserve to be, but we're not anywhere near done. You know, I'm the Google Autonomous Car Project lead. I'm trying to fundamentally alter transportation in a very, very new way. But of course, you know, that's not quite global because not everybody has a car, not everybody even has a road. You know, it's a big deal, but it's not a huge deal. Um, I'm all over the place. Now, if I'm Dave and I'm teaching Designing Your Life, I'm operating at the group level at Stanford. And, you know, you know <clears throat> we've taught a couple of thousand students over the past few years at our university. Um, <clears throat> making a bit of a difference. If I'm the higher education thought, if I'm talking to you today, 
you know, I'm actually now having an impact, hopefully, on education, and that actually occurs, or the kind of things that Rick's talking about actually happen, if that consortium makes a bigger tugboat and we actually move the aircraft carrier, that's actually a bigger impact than just the students at Stanford, you know, at a higher level. Um, the book, I wrote the book, you know, well, how powerful is a book? Well, you know, it just kind of lies there. Uh, you know, I'm not sure it's that big an impact on people's lives, but it does talk to more people. Talks to a lot more people. You know, in one year, I've spoken to about a hundred times as many people as I talked to in the decade before that. That's a leverage point. Now, so I actually occupy a domain. Most people actually occupy a domain. You're, you're in more than one role at the same time. I'm at least three people. Um, I've, uh, schizophrenia is really like a feature. Um, uh, and so that's the map. Now that's kind of complex because people haven't thought this way before. Is what we're getting at here clear? Is what's going on on this map make sense? Now you'll notice there are no units. And by the way, depending on the narrative you pick, you know, that brain surgeon could tell me why he deserves to be in another place. That's fine. I don't really care. It's really your point of view about this. So we're gonna, the exercise you're going to do is right now what I want you to do first is write down a number of roles you have had or roles you anticipate you might. So literally write down at least four, preferably six or more. <clears throat> if you haven't got a pen, uh, the team, there are still boxes of pens. If you're pen free, raise your hand. We'll get a pen to you. Okay. The MIT guy hasn't got a pen. Come on. Um, <clears throat> can we get a pen here? All right, there we go. Um, so write down different roles you have had and put in there a couple of roles you're imagining you might have in the future, including even those completely alternate roles. You know, eventually I'm going to drop all this and become the next Cirque du Soleil clown. I'm going to go into equine therapy, you know, whatever it might be. Now, once you've got a list, then map them. Right, just put them on the map as best you can. Keeping in mind, and this is the hardest part about teaching this, by the way, this is our newest tool, um, there is no better place. There is no moral valence hiding it. Up and to the right is not better. You know, big new is not necessarily better than renewing small. This is, they're just places, okay? So according to you, where would you put those roles on this particular map? Where do they engage? How do they engage with the world? Not infrequently, somebody will tell me, gosh, the way, depending on the way I say it, Dave, I could put the same role in two completely different places. That's great. Put them both down. Call it A and B. We'll come back to that. Because this has to do with picking your internal narrative. Okay, now, once you've drawn that, <clears throat> what I want you to do, is our, our favorite question, we do this question all the time for reflection, what do you notice? I already asked you this once. What did you notice about Rick's presentation? So just look at that thing you just drew, almost as though you hadn't been the one who drew it, and let your eye fall on, huh, what do you notice? What insights or questions surface for you now that you glance at your role landscape? It's all over. They cluster. I still don't get it. Um, <clears throat> I'm bored. What, you know, it doesn't matter. What, what are your observations? So. Stand up, grab somebody, so get, in, get into a pair, or if you're in a bad corner, a, tri a triad, but try not to be alone, and, and just uh, what do, uh, briefly show somebody what your map looked like, and here's what I noticed. Have a short conversation about what you just did with the person next to you, starting now. If you're in a lonely corner, go find somebody. <laughs> Give you about five minutes for that. Okay, how many of you would say, that was interesting? That was an interesting conversation. How many, how many say, oh, God, you know, I just, I, I just worked on this yesterday. You know, it's, we're doing this again. Um, by the way, in terms of, you know, design-oriented education and talking about this is the newest exercise we do because it came out of office hours. I noticed in hundreds of office hours conversations, particularly with my former students, we have a deal, Bill and I have a deal. If you take one of our classes, you get office hours free for life, which is a really good deal because my consulting rate's really high. Uh, but the, um, and literally last week I had office hours with a five year before student, an eight year before student, and an 18 year before student, going all the way back to my Cal days. Um, and, these, and, and these issues, uh, what, what, is the, what is the nature, what's the fabric, not just is this cool, is this hot, am I working on important or growing things, but is it, is it in this you know, positive additive space, is it in this negative remediation space, is it in this sustaining ongoing place, and, and, and where, am I, where am I? Am I? Am I small, local, global, national, cosmic, you know, universal, you know, trans-universal? Uh, where, where am I operating? Comes up all the time, but we don't normally frame this question, right? How many of you have done this, this particular exercise before? Yeah. But it comes up, right? 
It has th these two questions, the nature of the work I'm doing and where I engage, have a huge effect on the way people experience themselves as being authentic or meaning making or what have you. Um, so the, the impact <coughs> map, think about fit and there's more than one version of you. People can migrate around, different, ver you know, when I'm over here I feel this way and over here I feel that way. There is no better or worse place. You know, there's more than one place you fit. So that's just an example. So we just stopped out, did a quick you know, test drive of the kinds of things we do with our students to address these kinds of questions. We try, we try really hard not to should on our students. We do not should on our students. We recommend they don't should on themselves. Um, we try to frame things in a way that gets you to a place where you can have an insight or a noticing and become self-directed, self-authoring. You know, um, we, we are trying to be vigilant about catching the answer hiding in the question. You know, I, do, I don't particularly like the last 15 seconds even of that Alan Watts video because he, gives, he actually answers the question. Life is for, he actually answers the question. We try not to answer it for you, we try to get you better at answering it. That's the whole point. Now, this brings me to our biggest, my personal <clears throat> favorite of the biggest dysfunctional belief popular in the culture today, which is, that's weird. There's a great big thing there that's not showing, uh, which really disappeared, which, which, which said, are you being the best you? Are you being the best you? There's a great big sign that it's not showing. Um, and so, uh, you know, is this really the best you? Are you being your best self? Are you living your best possible life? Are you sure? Is this really it? Are, you're, not, you're not having FOMO, are you? You know, fear of missing out? You know, that other thing I should have done? Oh, it's not Owen. Oh, Bucknell. Bucknell was on the thing. I shouldn't be a Bucknell, not Owen. That's really not it, um, you know. <clears throat> you know, or are you settling? You're not settling, are you? I mean, we're called. How many PhDs in the room? PhDs don't settle. You know, we buy, we have got the three star stripes. We got the funny hat. We are designated as the smartest people on the planet. Come on, we don't settle. Um, you know, if you now if you're being beset by those questions at all, and people are, you know, you're trying to be the best. You know, here's the prime business. You know, there's a business adage that goes, you know, the good is the enemy of the better, and the better is the enemy of the best. Are you being your best? Are you? Are you? You know that Tony Robbins stuff? Don't get me started. Um, <laughs> here's the problem with best. Best means there is a stable set of criteria against which all viable alternatives can and deserve to be evaluated and which can be understood well enough that you can make a clear distinction that one alternative is undisputably greater than all the others, ergo it is the best. The problem with the different versions of the way you could live your life is that they bring different criteria. I'm 64, I have four going on, seven grandchildren, they've been busy. Um, <clears throat> literally, I got five adult kids. Um, very busy people, you know, and I'm on my fifth career, they tell me. So can you help me out, please? Is my grandfather self better than my author self? Is my author self better than my startup consultant self? Better than my educational reformer self? How do I compare them? They don't compare. Ergo, there is no such thing as a best you, we would suggest. There are lots of good yous. So, the soliloquy finishes not just with the, you know, the better is the enemy of the best, but the false best is the enemy of the available better. You know, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And we got a lot of people who've decided they have to be their best selves. If there is no singular answer to who you are as a human being, then you just decided to be signed up to be unhappy the rest of your life. Don't go there, you don't need to. Um, so, <clears throat> In fact, we actually do an exercise, I'm going to skip this because we haven't got time, um, to help people actually figure out, we do a Gedanken experiment uh, to actually come up with how many different lives you could actually be. If there were in fact a, let's just do it really fast, you guys are smart. Okay, assume the following two things are true. It is a multiverse, there are infinite universes, angstroms apart in the 19th dimension if we but knew how to measure it, you know, and the wormhole thing turned out to be true, string theory is right, in fact we now have access to that epistemologically, so you can have concurrent consciousness in all the universes if you want them. And you can be in as many universes as you want. One funny rule, however, it's kind of like open table, you have to reserve in advance. You have to, <clears throat> so you can be as many people as you want, as many versions of you as you want. We keep observing there's more aliveness in each life that we meet than one lifetime permits you to express, i.e. there's more than one of you in there. So how many of them are there? Let's say the life you're in now you really like, you do that again if you could. My daughter Lisa, now 30, when she was five, thought spending her first day at Disneyland with 42 trips on Dumbo was a good use of time. You know, so let's go do Dumbo 42 times, Dad. Okay, great. Um, so if you want to do Dumbo 42 times in 42 universes, you can do that. If you want to be your PhD self, you want to be your counselor self, you want to be your artist self, however many slots you want you can have, but you have to reserve in advance. 
So I'm going to go one, two, three, and when I would have said four, I want you to shout the number of how many life slots you'd like to reserve in the multiverse. As many as you want, but just not past that point. Like, I don't know what I'd do with that one. Okay, get a number in your head. I know it's not an out loud kind of crowd here, PhDs, but please strongly shout your number, own your number. Okay, one, two, three. Five, six. I heard eight, five, 15, and 100, so the median is 29. The, um, <laughs> Which simply means, you know, if the number is anywhere north of three, you're mostly not going to happen. I lied, by the way, it's not true. The, um, and uh, you're, uh, you're smart people in a target-rich environment. So, of course, you're, there's no fear of missing out. There's domo, delight of missing out. You know, because isn't it, all that, all that missing out tells you is you haven't fallen asleep yet. Ooh, how cool that the world is still going by, and I get to own what I'm really doing. So we flip the thing around. It's not about what you miss, it's about what you do. Of course cool stuff's going to go by. Might that have been better? Sure, because you haven't got perfect knowledge about the future. That's not the question. You know. <clears throat> now, because there's so many of you, the reframe is that there are lots of great use. It's never too late. Let's get going on the odyssey of your life. We call it odyssey planning. So when we do design, we ideate your odyssey plan. We ideate your future, oh no, we can't do that. We have to ideate your futures because there's more than one of you. We restrict you to merely three. Now, in, we do this class, by the way, in 20 hours over 10 weeks. We do it in 20 hours over five days. We do an intense version in eight hours in one day. Um, and in the one day version, we actually start the Odyssey planning. We do have you do three different versions of your next five years, com three completely different versions of you in 12 minutes. Um, we're not doing that exercise today, uh, but that, it works great. We've done it with thousands of people, and it turns out it either takes about 12 minutes or two weeks to do this assignment. You know, think long, think wrong. So get, capturing people's quick thoughts can be really illustrative. So we actually have a timeline. I'll just run through what this exercise is, because it's really the capstone exercise of the class. It's the centerpiece of our, of our paradigm, really, so you need to understand it. So it's really just a timeline, zero to five years. You put down on that, I'll give you an example, um, <clears throat> the milestones personally and professionally. It's not just design your career, it's design your life. You know? And then, of course, you would name that, because once you look at that experience of life, it's got a certain narrative to it. And then you actually do the dashboard. And the dashboard is a feedback loop, so you can actually get your own readings on your own ideas. That dashboard is a little unusual. <clears throat> the dials are from zero to 100%. Do I have the resources? Do I have the stuff necessary to pull the plan off? Uh, what's my temperature on this? Does, am I hot? Am I cold? Do I like it emotionally? What's my confidence that if I actually do this thing, it will work? But wait, the smart people say, isn't confidence and resources really the same thing? Sort of, but not really, different sides of the coin. The resource dial is the objective analysis of the availability of the tools necessary. The confidence dial is the emotional intelligence of how I feel about it. They don't always correlate, and when they don't, that's an interesting thing to take a look at. Coherence, which we define as the coherent life, <clears throat> which would be a completed mindset triangle, you know, who I am, what I believe, and what I'm doing are in alignment. We spend a lot of time on the issue of becoming a coherent person. Um, and so co how coherent is this particular plan you just had in mind? I.e., is it authentic? Does it fit? Is it one of the real yous? Or now that I look at this story that I just drew for myself, do I hear my mother's voice yet again? Or there's my PhD advisor. He just won't go away. Uh, you know, or is it really me? Is this one of my voices? So that's what the dashboard looks like. <clears throat> an example would be, this actually would be a mid-career person. We're now talking to people of all ages. An example, people probably look closer to some of our ages than our undergrads. So let's say her name is Anne. She's in her late 40s. And this is using what I know to help kids. She's now actually a senior executive in HR in the corporate world. But early on in her 20s, she almost majored in child development and went into something to do with kids. And she says, maybe I want to go back and pick up that version of me. So I'm going to form a 501c3, I'm going to start a nonprofit. I'm going to organizing kind of person, and I'm going to focus on reading, reading comprehension for at-risk kids, and the first thing I'm going to do is prototype curriculum off the shelf. I'm going to do a, do a buy, not a build. A lot of people have thought this issue through. I don't need to worry about that. What I'm really going to work on is the scaling capability. I'm going to deliver this thing. I'm really good at systems and delivery. I'm going to change the world of uh, reading comprehension for at-risk kids by finding the best technique and learning how to scale it into the field. I, I think I can get that going in five years. This is not a little side trip on the a thing on the side. This is a new career. I'm really going for it. Kind of a Silicon Valley sort of story. You know, <clears throat> gee, now that I think about it, if I'm going to work that hard, in year four and five, I'm going to be so busy. Boy, what else do I need to keep in mind? Don't forget the family. I mentioned that Anne is in her late 40s. That means her parents are, are aging. What do we do about mom and dad? They don't want to live with us when they get older. They've made that clear. They want to go probably to a facility. We've got to find that place. We've got to find that place and get them there before it's too late. Oh, yeah, too late. Speaking of too 
too late. You know, let's not forget to get the family project done, the family story project. You know, we, we keep saying we should write that stuff down. We never do. Both mom and dad are only children. Once they go, the story dies with them. You know, we can't defer that. We can't defer that. We need to really keep that in mind. And write that stuff down. Speaking of writing stuff down, what about school? I haven't written things in a long time. Um, I'm really interested in this topic. I'm also incompetent. I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, so maybe I should go back to school. I don't know if I need a degree, but I probably need some classes in this child development stuff. If I'm going to pick a reading comprehension methodology, I should do that with some competency. Boy, you know, if that's <clears throat> true, I better take a vacation before it gets too busy. Let's go back to Paris. Dan and I said in our honeymoon in Paris, we're going to come back every five years and renew our vows. Kind of never happened. You know, let's go get that done before it's entirely too late. And on the way home, let's stop on the Galapagos because I'd like to see them before they're submerged. Um, and frankly, she just literally uh, had some white space left. She goes, man, if I do all that, that's pretty cool. I should write a book. Um, you know. Now, that's a fairly full life, but literally it takes about three, four minutes to do that. Then she says, how do I feel about that? Well, resource-wise, you know, I'm in pretty good shape, but I don't have this stuff all figured out yet, but I know how to organize things. I like it a lot. My confidence is really reasonably high. My coherence is fairly good. When Anne was being honest with herself, she said, here's my real question for myself. First of all, do I really want to get this busy right about the time my parents are aging? I can't reschedule their elderly years. But the really hard question is, the more I look at this, I go, do I really want to do this? Or do I like remembering I wanted to do this? Do I want to be this person? Or do I get a kick out of pretending I want to be this person? I love the noble story of the child developing youth that I was in my 20s. Maybe I don't really care. You know, do I really love these at-risk kids? Does it look as messy to me? You know, running companies is a lot easier. Do I really mean this? Do I really mean this? You've got to go a little, you know, have kind of a, a come to Anne meeting with herself. Um, that's what this process wants to help you do. Now, we say three versions of it. Maybe even the person who said 29. Yeah, but I have to write down three. So when people have a hard time coming up with three different versions of themselves, we get them a template. We actually don't show this to our students much because they don't need help coming up with three versions of themselves. That's not a problem. They often say, can I have a second sheet? Um, so if, if you have trouble, they'll say thing one, probably just a great version of the next five years of the life you're already in. Assume for the sake of pure ideation, not planning, uh, that things are working fine. And then just assume whatever it is you're doing is over. You know, that the game is over. You know, it turns out Rick and the boys and the AI guys got together and they completely figured out this experiential education thing. We don't need faculty anymore. We got this done. The students can do it all. It's great. You know, we have mind transfer. The content just goes right across. Then it's all process led. Turns out we got the process facilitated well enough. We don't even need professors. It's a great savings, as it turns out. Um, so, <clears throat> so that whole thing's like over. So thanks for coming. You go home. Um, you know, how many of you actually lived through, used to do a job nobody does anymore because it's over? We used to have a job that is, you can't get again. Yeah, I've done that three times. Um, so it does happen. So just what would you do if you had to do something else? And the last one is the wild card thing, the other. What would you do if money and regard were no object? If I could promise you there'd be enough money, not a ton, but enough, and they won't laugh at you. No, really, they won't laugh at you. What would it be? And most people have one of those. Now that brings up something that we are well known for in design, which is this whole idea of the wild idea. Why, oh, you guys love wild idea. You love all those post-it notes, you know. You know, uh, <clears throat> how many of you have been to the meeting? The how many done, who's done brainstorming? How many of you have been to the, the following brainstorming meeting? We get together, and we pass out the little pads, and we talk, and we, have, and we get the whiteboards covered with post-it notes, covered with post-it notes, really great. Wow, look at all the ideas. And we stand back, and we get out our iPhone, we take a picture, and we upload it to the cloud, and then we go back to work. Who's been in that meeting? Okay, that's not brainstorming, okay? That's steps one and two with no outcome. Uh, that is not brainstorming. That's why brainstorming gets a bad. We are not into post-it wastage. Brainstorming is not about post-it wastage. It's about actually having ideas for a reason. One of the reasons, not the only, I'll remind you of here, why the wild idea. So design kind of gets this rap for being silly. You know, wasting, you know, post-its and coming up with ideas that don't work anyway. That seems, that's what designers seem to like to do. No, that's not it. The reason is because of your brain. Is your brain on ideas. So you have a nice black and white idea, a nice solid idea, and that part of your brain that's always watching you, always making sure you're doing the right thing, you know, the internal critic, says, good job, Dave, nice appropriate idea, continue with caution, I like what you're doing. And then you have this wild, multicolored, tie-dyed idea, and that little guy inside your head kind of goes, what is wrong with you, Dave? Are you, that, that, here's, here's five ways this is not gonna work. That, and don't say this in public, you're gonna embarrass us. You know, what are you, what are you doing? And when you do that, when that part of your brain kicks off, it literally erects a barrier 
and the part of your brain that should be heating up and having ideas cools way the heck off, and behind that barrier are a whole bunch of hidden ideas. Now, we don't know for sure that the killer idea is back there, but it might be. So the idea about wild ideas is not that the wild idea is better. Sometimes the wild idea is a great idea. Sometimes the wild idea minus some craziness, just one click back from the crazy, is actually a terrific idea. But that's not an assumption. The assumption is if you can't afford a wild idea, you probably drowned a whole bunch of other ones without even knowing it. So you have to force yourself to have wild ideas. It calms the internal critic because you want access to all your ideas. That's why we do it that way. Now, then we have you do it, 15 minutes go by, we have you debrief, have a conversation. This turns out to be a seminal moment in the experience. So <clears throat> the point of that is there's more than one of you don't have just one idea. Having more ideas generates better ideas. I want to get you to break pretty quick here. Um, now, well, of course, once you've got all these ideas, holy cow, now how do we choose, right? The next thing clear is make a choice. Wrong. No, we don't make a choice. We now move to prototyping. We go from the flare, right, of lots of ideas to starting to focus in on what do I actually want to learn more about. And this is why I want to make a distinction between a design prototype and what I call a late stage engineering prototype. The word prototype applies to lots of different things. I want to make sure we get the right image. We prototype in design to ask interesting questions, expose our assumptions, get other people involved with us, and in life design, sneak up on the future. I can't remember who it is, Bill often quotes, and he remembers who said, you know, the future is not unavailable, it's just unequally distributed. There are people living in the future you're imagining for yourself today if you could find them and have a conversation about it. Now, if you're Elon Musk, maybe there aren't any of those people, but, you know, there are some people who are, a lot of people are already working on things you're thinking about. So we prototype for those reasons, not for the purpose of testing out does it really work. So a late stage engineering prototype before we put this new you know, jet engine on an airplane with people in it, how about we spin it up to 3x you know, normal speed inside a cinder block thing, throw a goose through it and see what happens before it kills anybody. That's a late stage engineering test prototype. Really good thing to do. Design prototypes are really early. They, have, they always fail because the only reason they're built is to learn something about stuff we knew we didn't know. We know we don't know what we're doing. We know we've made assumptions. We just don't know what they are. Let's go flush them out by doing these design prototypes. You know, in life, it is really improv theater. We are making it up as we go along because nobody knows the future. So it's got to be iterative. Design thinking applied to life design is just learning how to do a really good job of making it up as you go along getting good at the improv of life. So a good prototype, therefore, is cheap, fast, and actually learn something. Now, <clears throat> there are two kinds in life design, very simple. There are conversations and experiences. By conversations, we mean just go get the story, uh, an informational interview, if you will, and that's very easy to do, uh, and then go try something. So uh, let me illustrate. What do you prototype? You prototype where your curiosity takes you because that will keep the process going. So if Anna looks at this and goes, just says, what gets my attention? The first thing actually was write a book which she put down, frankly, as a joke. Literally, the woman who did this put that down as a joke because she had some white space left. She goes, and, but, but I notice my eye keeps looking at that. I'm so curious about that. Easy thing to have a conversation with. Go find an agent. Go find an author. You know, Bill and I had never been in book land before. It's very strange territory. Um, and so we met a bunch of these people. What's it going to be like? That's one of the reasons I spent two years trying not to do it. Um, <clears throat> because it's really hard. Who's written a book here? But, but, yeah, it's awful. Um, the, um, <laughs> If you're like me, you know, other people seem to like it. Um, but nonetheless, you can go find that out through conversations. Now, she also thought this going to school thing was kind of interesting. She hadn't done that in a long, long time. And we said, you should experience that. And that's not that hard to experience. You can audit a class. You can even get a professor to let you write a paper or two if there's a friendly out there. We set her up in a couple of situations. And sure enough, she went out there and she tried it out. Turned out what she was really afraid of picked on. She'd never been the popular girl in school in the first place, and now she's going to be the old unpopular girl. She thought, that, you know, these millennials, apparently they're nasty. You know, I, I don't know millennials. You know, uh, what are they going to do to me? Well, it turns out they thought it was really cool she came back to class. She was, for the first time in her life, the cool girl in class that had never happened before. She thought it was fabulous. You know, and she forgot she loved learning, and she's pretty good at it. And that took about six hours to really get a good hands-on experience. It was not that hard to come up with. So those are what life prototypes can look like. Um, <clears throat> now, you know, if we had time and you had actually done that exercise, we'd actually have you circle those things uh, to think about what is it you might want to go learn more about. It's really the parts of your future life to which you're saying, tell me more. Tell me more about books. Tell me more about school. Tell me more about a postdoc, whatever it might be. Now, to get that prototype, you have to have a connection. That connection means it's time to do networking. 
you know, at this point, we often say, let's say you're a bunch of students, it kind of goes, so this is finally the time when we can have the networking module, and you're all kind of going, ooh, great, the networking module, I'm so excited, I love networking. So goes, how many of you love networking? How many of you love networking? It's like your favorite thing. Yeah, all three of you, let's have a little meeting <laughs> later. Okay, so even, even the MBAs, I go, to the, I go to the business school and I figure everybody's gonna be like, no, two, two MBAs even think it's cool. Why, because you know, like most people, like this young woman, yeah, it's kind of sleazy, you're using people, time for another reframe, I'm just ripping people off for my self-interest. No, 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 no. The reframe on networking is simply, you're asking for directions. Who's ever given a stranger directions? Who's done it more than once? Think about it, you got used. Complete stranger walks up to you, you know, you're, you know, you're doing your email, you're waiting for the jitney bus to go to across the campus, you know, and some fool who doesn't, you know, doesn't know what he's doing says, oh, can you help me? Sure, you might be a rapist, but no problem, let's go for it, you know. Uh, you know not, even, not even checking the website about whether or not you're a dangerous person, you know. <clears throat> and you talk to them, and then when you're all done, what happens? You give them the directions, and then what happens? They leave. Bottle of wine, five bucks. Metro card, anything? Anybody ever get anything for this? You got you. Oh, the back, the guy in the back. Thank you. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you. Yeah, so why do we do this? Because we're human beings. Research now shows, ding, 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 people like being helpful. Who knew? Uh, so it turns out people like being helpful. So when, you're lo when we're lost in author land and asking for directions from agents and authors and publishers, they will show you around. Why? Because they like their town. People don't move to the town unless they have a nice welcoming experience. Networking is just asking for directions. So by the way, even this conference is proved. There are probably questions about your future you think would be interesting to know more about. There are people in this room who could help you. So. Don't forget to get that done. So wrapping it up for break. Um, <clears throat> what's unique about this thing? Um, first of all, you know, a lot of people are telling you how you're supposed to figure your life out, you know, and most of them are self-anointed. We've actually done this a couple of thousand times now. So when we're talking to people about bringing this uh, into their environment at a place like Olin or another college or another company, you know, you're thousands of people in, other people have gone before you. Number two, it's actually research validated. I'll show you the research data in the second section after the break. Um, so, you know, we don't actually believe in alternative facts at Stanford. We think like real facts are pretty handy. Um, so we use this thing called data to get them. Um, <clears throat> and we have data that says this really works, not just trust me. Um, and oddly enough, having started the design program at Stanford in 1963, um, <clears throat> you know, many, many years ago, uh, the human centered design, you know, what's a human problem? Oh, I know, being a human. How about we do human centered design on ourselves? We never pointed, you know, the tool back at home uh, until we thought this up about 10 years ago. Um, so it's the first time we've actually brought our competency to our big question. Um, we put those three things together, kind of worked out. And the thing we're hearing again is, is because, why does it work? Because human centered design, and human centered design means two things. I want to remind everybody that's the technical name of design thinking. The human um, adjective, human-centered design. The human-centered part is two, there's two humans we're designing for here. The designer and the user. So human-centered design is thinking how do human beings think? That's that wild idea stuff. How do they think? How do they work? How do they collaborate? How do they innovate? How do they do the process of creating things? How does that actually work? Let's, let's maximize for that. And how do we make those things for humans that can really be used? So let's humanly design for humans is what we mean by human-centered design. So when you humanly design for yourself, it becomes really more workable. So again, what people have told us is it's actionable and that actionability leaves them more hopeful. That's the, the two key things we hear back from people but when they, when they take this stuff and when they apply it with our students. So in designing a life, we've, we're just trying to be a little more human in the process, ending with a more helpful and hopeful outcome. So at Olin, or in education in general, as we are working toward institutionally trying to become more you know, passionate, STEM-capable, connected, kale-loving, innovative, world-changing, and just downright <laughs> dazzling, um, let us not forget to try to be a little bit more human. That would be a good thing. Now, the, the, uh, this is not an academic talk, but it'll see a, a little more academic and it'll be really luxury. So I'm gonna go really fast through some questions that um, I seem to be what Rick thought might be on your mind, okay? So, <clears throat> so you know, if we were just doing, if you were, I'm just imagining you're thinking, well, you, should we do something like this at Olin? What questions might come to mind? Well, the questions are, you know, why do this at all? You know, how did we get started? You know, what's the pedagogical approach we use? What are the learning goals? You know, what are the results you've actually had? And what have you guys learned so far? So I'm gonna answer all those questions. Um, are those reasonable questions? 
Okay, I mean, as soon as it's boring, let me know, okay? I live in holy fear of boring people. Uh, the, um, so why do this at all? Okay, so I'm actually, this, I, I know, hand to God, I did not collaborate with Rick on this part of the presentation. Um, uh, it will look an awful lot like the president's notes. The, um, but going back 11 years, so the, what I'm actually, I literally am dropping in some slides here, some rather badly done slides from 11 years ago. This is, this is like two years before that meeting, Jim, that I'll come to back later when Jim decided to allow the world to take this class uh, with some other people. So uh, <clears throat> Bill and I ta sat down with Paul Brest, the former dean of the law school, the then president of the Hewlett Foundation, you know, who has a big arm in education. And we were talking to him about what we had in mind to get started, you know, would he help us do that? So the conversation was, hey, you know, once upon a time, you know, education was really just about, you know, get a degree, then go out and get a job. But now, you know, students are coming out into a world where, you know, they're, they're having this, what David Brooks calls the Odyssey years, that's why we call it the Odyssey plan. You know, this decade between 20 and 30, you're trying to find yourself, you're doing all this stuff, there's all these different issues, I might have more than one career, I might want to start something, I might want to have a job. It's a, it's a much messier world than just like the little guy that comes out of grad school and starts selling insurance. Um, it's, and in that mess, you know, you add to that one of the big issues in the world that are really occupying students' minds these days, again, this is 12 years ago, you know, and, and, and the way we handle things is not working. So it's not about get a job. <clears throat> so, uh, so the opportunity educationally is to get, take that, you know, education career navigation thing and spread it out a little bit and reinsert formation you know, as part of what it is that we do in the institution. You know, so the, the opportunity is to restore, because this is actually going, you know, back to the future, uh, the university's missional contribution of education and formation. Does this seem kind of aligned, Rick? So, yeah, it has an Olin sort of a feel to it. Uh, so that's what we were talking about, you know, um, <clears throat> and Paul said that's really interesting, no. Um, so he doesn't, had no interest in helping us at the time. Not because it was a bad idea, but because he, was, he wanted us to go prove that Stanford cared enough that we'd, we'd get funded by Stanford before he would actually chime in. Um, so if we bring that conversation forward 12 years, you know, what do today's students want? What's on their mind? Well, actually, what they want is the same things we all do. So if you actually go to um, a colleague of ours, Dan Pink, who's really kind of a business author. He's sort of a business-oriented Malcolm Gladwell kind of guy. He's not a researcher, but he's an aggregator. He wrote a very popular and well-researched book called Drive, which is about people's motivations. You know, and in it, he actually refers to one particular study, which I'm gonna give you a clip of. Um, this is a minute and a half of a 10-minute, one of those talking whiteboard things where he's doing like his best 10 minutes. And let me set up what we're dropping into. He's talking about a study uh, that's been repeated many times on the issue of how does compensation correlate to performance? If you pay people more, do you get better results? Um, and it turns out yes to a point, and then it boomerangs in an unexpected way. So that's what he's talking about. So with, let's take the experiment. We're going to go to Madurai, India, rural India where $50, $60, whatever the number was, is actually a significant sum of money. So they replicated the experiment in India roughly as follows. Small rewards, the equivalent of two weeks' salary, um, I mean, sorry, uh, small performance, low performance, two weeks' salary, medium performance, about a month's salary, um, high performance, about two months' salary. Okay, so those are real good incentives, okay? So you're gonna get a different result here. Well, what happened, though, was that the people offered the medium reward did no better than the people offered the small reward. But this time around, the people offered the top reward, they did worst of all. Higher incentives led to worse performance. What's interesting about this is that it actually isn't all that anomalous. This has been replicated over and over and over again by psychologists, by um, some extent by sociologists, uh, and by economists, over and over and over again. For simple, straightforward tasks, those kinds of incentives, if you do this, then you get that, they're great for tasks that are algorithmic, set of rules where you have to just follow along and get a right answer, if then rewards, carrots and sticks, outstanding. But when the task gets more complicated, when it requires some conceptual creative thinking, those kinds of motivators demonstrably don't work. Fact, money is a motivator um, at work, but in a slightly strange way. If you don't pay people enough, they won't be motivated. What's curious about, there's another paradox here, which is that the best use of money as a motivator is to pay people enough to take the issue of money off the table. Pay people enough so that they're not thinking about money and they're thinking about the work. Now, once you do that, it turns out there are three factors that the science shows lead to better performance, um, not to mention personal satisfaction. 
Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So that's the big takeaway. Mastery, you know, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. How many of you would be attracted to getting more autonomy, mastery, and purpose in your lives? That's like attractive to you. Yeah, okay. Now, um, and then I'll ask my students, how many of you think that the organization you're likely to go to work for, you'll probably get a job, you, you probably won't necessarily work for yourself right out of school, whether it's nonprofit, government, wherever you go, that the management system at the place you're gonna land institutionally, that your bosses are lying awake nights worrying about how they can get you more autonomy, mastery, and purpose. You know, and very few hands will go up. Now, the, the truth is, actually, the good news is that's a rising tide. There are more employers who are thinking about this more. Uh, but the truth is, where do these things come from? They come from you. So part of our job is to, uh, in an educational system, empower students to actually understand what these things are, what they mean to them, and how to get them. You know, because you, 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 your boss can't give them to you. Now, if, you're, if your working environment, if the, if the culture around you was supportive of these things, explicit in nurturing of these things, it's a lot easier. You know, so good job, Olin. Um, but, you know, we're not there yet. Now, if you want to drill further in, this is, again, years old. So Jennifer Akers, who's a prof at our business school, works particularly in motivation. She's a marketing expert, you know, which is what is really on people's minds and studies markets. You know, um, by the way, one, one of the ways you know somebody is not a millennial is they said the word. Um, <clears throat> so the only people talking about millennials are the older people trying to sell them stuff. So overwhelmingly, it's a market segment. Um, and so when you look at them as a market segment, what do you discover about them? Well, <clears throat> Uh, if people think that these millennials are mostly focused on happiness. It turns out that the uh, data is not really consistent with that. The data really paints the picture that what's really going on is they're interested in living lives defined by meaning more so than what people would call happiness. This is back in the early days of the positive psychology movement that really shifted from happiness to thriving as well. So that's been a moving target. You know, in 2011, a report from the Career Advisory Board said the number one factor young adults under 31 were looking for was a sense of meaning. Um, <clears throat> according to their managers, you know, it's not primarily motivated by money, but three quarters of young adults surveyed, according to managers, said meaningful work was among the most important defining attributes of their careers and their lives. So how are we configuring and helping people to do that? So again, this is the question, why, why are we doing this? You know, is because as an educational institution, can you get there from here? Can you do formative things? Um, uh, without violating the autonomy of the individual or violating your inclusiveness and your breadth of thinking. That's the really kind of, kind of the challenge. So what's missing, back to the 11-year-old um, presentation, <clears throat> is a structured place for this important conversation with the right people, approach, tools, and guidance. We don't actually have it. It's assumed you'll figure it out while you're here on your own. So we should stop doing that. Now, so that's why. Why, why do this? Okay, so how do we get started at Stanford? Um, so how we got started at Stanford um, begin, I'm, this is a old, very old slide that I'm actually going to show. So literally, just very briefly, the history of how we got started was, and on the spring of 2007, Bill and Dave had lunch. Um, <clears throat> we had lunch because David Kelly got Hasso Plotner, the founder of SAP Software, the Bill Gates of Europe, to write a $40 million check to create a thing called the Hasso Plotner Institute for Design at Stanford, a.k.a. the D School. The, the institute working with graduate students uh, in interdisciplinary projects to push design thinking out into the world and learn how to do that, which was supposed to be a prototype to then create the one in Potsdam, Germany, which is the one that Hauser really wanted because he wanted a design institute in Germany. That's how we did that. Um, so David couldn't both run the design program, run the institute, and run IDEO at the same time. He could be two people, not three, and so he went to Bill and said, Bill, would you run the design program, the thing that graduates bachelor's degrees and master's degrees in, uh, in design at Stanford, and Bill jumped at the chance. I heard that, Bill's an old friend, and I thought, well, they're just crazy enough to want to do something like this. Um, so we had lunch, uh, which I thought was the first lunch of about a year of talking about this kind of strange idea about formation, using design thinking to move students into their own lives in a different kind of way. It's not really what we do in the university, but hey, you guys are kind of nuts, maybe you could give it a try. Five minutes in, Bill goes, absolutely, let's go, we should do this. I've been thinking about it off and on for 20 years, I can't believe I haven't started yet, so we'll prototype it this summer, we'll start teaching in the fall. So in the fall of 2007, we taught the designer's voice to 12 kids. This is very, very, very small. Of, by, and for design students only. How to find your vocational voice as a designer. You know what design is, but you don't know which designer you are. How do you find yourself in your profession? Professional formation, that was the concept. It was really a guided imagery bull session on Friday afternoons. Um, <clears throat> and we then did that um, with grad students uh, in the winter. So we did that for the first year, then you know, we did it for another year, so we're two years in, teaching these little tiny, you know, sort of bull sessions with Bill and Dave with about 15, 20 students at a time. You know, and then Sherry Shepard, um, 
who's uh, in the ME department and cares deeply about education and prof professional formation and STEM and women in business and what have you, um, is looking across and doing some things on the side. She actually collaborates with Patty Gumpert, who is the Vice Provost of Graduate Education at the university. So Sherry's one of those triple threats. You know, she's an administrator as well as a researcher as well as a teacher, and she cares about that stuff a lot. She kind of goes, hey, what are you guys doing over there? So the, what came out of that was we started teaching grad students. So Engineering 311B, which is a course she was already teaching, we completely reinvented and changed the curriculum to sneak this stuff in when people weren't looking. Um, so right now, we're just still running on the sneaky program. We're, we're, we're talking a little differently on Friday afternoons in a room that most people don't pay attention to with design students who are already kind of crazy. That's fine. You guys go do what you want. You know, and then Sherry, who's into it, is hanging out with some PhDs. We're having this conversation. You know, but it's starting to get some visibility about two and a half years in. You know, <clears throat> and so then we keep teaching these classes we've taught. We're into our third year. And then share, um, Julie Lithcott Hames, the Dean of Freshmen, you know, and Sherry Palmer, who's the Associate Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education, kind of go, that looks really interesting. And then Lance Choi, who runs the Career Center, says, couldn't you do this for everybody? And we kind of go, okay. Um, so <clears throat> he actually funds and we develop a prototype of Designing Your Life in the winter of 2010, and then we start teaching uh, in the spring of 2010 for the first time, this, the beginning of our third year um, on the campus designing your life to any junior or senior in any major, come on down, and we've been sold out ever since. So that's literally how it starts. Um, it includes before even that meeting, because I've been teaching at Cal a little bit um, in an undergraduate special system, which is easy to crack and doesn't really matter. Um, the, is, is, called DECAL, Democratic Education at Cal, you know, started in the 60s back when the animals ran the zoo. And uh, we don't want to learn war no more. We learn anything we want. You know? So I was teaching in the we can learn anything we want system, which is easy to crack, but doesn't make a big, an impact administratively at all. Uh, so students like it, nobody else cares. Um, <clears throat> and at Stanford, it's really hard to get in. And I sat down with an unnamed senior administrator, and he said, you know, here's the problem. You're probably not going to get a chance to do this kind of work here at all, no matter how you figure out how to do it. Uh, it's not the kind of thing we do. And if you do, go as fast as you possibly can, because as soon as they figure out what you're really doing, you're out of here. You know, you're going to get fired. And you've only got a master's degree anyway, so that's going to be easy. Um, you know, <clears throat> I mean, you know, basically an unemployed marketing guy teaching at Stanford. Um, and, uh, and, and we saw a significant shift in the mindset at Stanford about these things in real time. Um, and, and, the, and frankly, you could argue there are a lot of inflection points that led to where we are today. Uh, but I think pretty unequivocally, the, the, the winning inflection point was in um, November of 2011, you know, with a meeting with 11 senior leaders of the, of the university and graduate ed, undergraduate ed in the School of Engineering. And Jim was there with, and brought Brad Osgood, his partner in crime from the School of Engineering. Um, <clears throat> and Bill and I briefly went through, what are we doing? And, here was, and here's one of the problems we were addressing. We overwhelmingly teach. We do a little bit of research when somebody else will fund a PhD we can collaborate with, but we don't actually do, we don't have funding for our own research. And we are teaching stuff that matters to everybody. Like the humanities students love the fact they could get two units of engineering credit for learning how to figure out what to do with themselves when they graduated. You know? um, and, uh, and so everybody liked what we were doing and everybody liked the way the students were responding and nobody thought it was their job to pay for it because it's not something we do. There's no place on the shelf for the life design function you know, of the university. It doesn't exist anymore. And so we asked, you know, a couple of different institutions on the campus, would you guys pony up a little bit of money so that we can start to not stop? Because frankly, these cool results we're getting are gonna be over in about six months unless somebody finds a way to pay for a little bit of something. And bless his heart, Jim raised his hand, um, as two, did two of the key leaders, and that's how we got started. Um, but we frankly just did it on beans and weenies with very, very small groups of people. And it was not this clever, stealthy Trojan horse strategy, you know, for flipping the university and then getting to come to talk to you all. Um, it was like just where is there an unlocked bathroom window we can sneak in when they're not looking? I mean, it really is just, it was, it was strategic opportunism. I wouldn't have done anything they let me do, but if there was something we could do that was on point, you know, and it could very well have never been anything more than just this kind of goofy little seminar with a dozen design students now and then taught once or twice a year. We did not know it was going to explode in our hands. So sometimes you just do what you can do and you see where it goes from there. It really was prototype iteration. Um, so that's how we got started. What's the pedagogical approach? 
Well, um, we still call it problem-based learning. I really like, I'm gonna go to DBL immediately, design-based learning, which is actually different. Um, but we bring up problem-based learning only because it's not traditional lecture. Um, and then the key thing for us is what we call the class architecture. So our class architecture we call the four C's, and the four C's are container, construct, community, and conversation. And the conversation, i.e. that thing happening around the table in the house we build, that's the picture of the house we build in Designing Your Life, is the crucial moment. By container, Again, we're trying to do this life design thing. We're trying to give you tools and ideas that will help you figure yourself out without telling you the answer. It's a tricky Goldilocks problem, not too hot, not too cold. So the container is what holds the conversation in. Well, it's ME104B, it's two units, it's Friday from three to five. You know, it's, I mean, class is a great container. Um, then there's gotta be a construct. When we get together, what, do we, what, do, what, do, what basis are we having this conversation? Oh, that's where design thinking is our construct. So we stand on the platform of design thinking. One of the reasons I think we have been successful, are we the first guys at Stanford to care about the formation of young student lives in a noble, meaningful way that will serve society? Heck no, are you kidding? There are lots of people who love this. We get lots of people coming to say, you know, I've been working on this for 10 years. I go, great, keep going. Uh, um, and what they've struggled with is most of them live in places that look like they house an answer. I'm from the ethics center because you're probably unethical and we should fix you. I'm from the chaplaincy and you're probably insufficiently spiritual. You should get a little more transcendent. You know, I'm coming from the meditation center. I'm coming from you know, the service learning group. You should be out there doing community service. So everybody, a lot of the people who have been trying to help these questions look like they live in the land of should. And students have a really, really good toximeter smelling should from across the room and they will run as fast as they can from people who go, I've got your answer. No, thank you. So we appear to be incredibly low-key agnostics. Like, hey, how's it going? Cool. So would you, you know, like some more ideas about your life? Uh, okay. Well, we teach some tools and ideas, and you can just maybe get a little better at thinking up, you know, what you might want to do. Would that work for you? Yeah, cool, come on down. You know, so just come on in, we'll give you some tools, you do whatever you want to with it. First thing we do is write your work view, write your worldview, do a values integration exercise. Now, if we called it the values integrated life, not an illegitimate name for the class, frankly, all four students would have a great time. <laughs> you know, but designing your life is in fact what we're doing and it really is pretty attractive. So, so this construct, and, and if we do the container right and we do the construct right, we can figure this thing right, we figure the rubric right, then the community will form around the table of its students in groups of nine, led by a, facil a trained facilitator, you know, and then the conversation occurs. We argue you can't do this alone, you can't do this all by yourself, you can't, we create the conversation in our, in our sections, and the section cohort is the echo chamber wherein you can hear your own voice, we like to say. So, the, so that class, arc, and these four C's, we keep coming, a new idea crops up or a problem crops up, and it will usually be one of these, is break, the construct broke, or we, 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 we leaked the container and people got lost or what have you. Um, these have been really impactful for us. Uh, the content is really simple. It's ideas and tools organized into a framework, which I showed you before. It is very important that it is not a system. It is not a theory. It's really barely even a method. It's literally a bunch of stuff, you know, <clears throat> again, and so that's the framework, you know, and that's all the stuff. And so what we tell them on day one is, okay, here's the stuff. And it's rationally organized in these three chunks, and they make sense. We keep coming back to this framework as a correlation. But we don't pretend it's an oversimplified do steps one through nine, and you'll be fine. It's nowhere near that simple. You're really smart people. You're all in different places. We're going to give you these tools. We'll teach you about 40 things. You'll probably buy into 12 to 15 of them at the most. So you'll skim the stuff off, you'll throw the rest away or just put it in a notebook somewhere. And the only promise we make is, if you in fact learn those ideas, like the reframes, and you think with the ideas differently than you did before, and you act with the tools differently than you did before, you're probably a little better off than if you've done. That's the only promise we make. Um, <clears throat> and that turns to work out fine, because it, really it really respects the student. Now again, why does it work? You know, I, uh, I want to focus in on, on the critical difference which ca crops up all the time. I mean, I'm out in the workplace, I'm out in the, bus the business world, I'm actually doing a pilot in a large corporation <clears throat> um, that I can't name, but they do a lot of search. Um, the, um, <laughs> and I'm talking to a very senior uh, HR exec, um, not this woman, it kind of looks like her, um, <clears throat> and she asked me just before I run this pilot with about 25 people, oops, you're right. Um, 
No, really, this really bugs me because I was the world's first mouse product manager. I helped the guys start Logitech, and this is bad design. Um, um, but nonetheless, um, so she asked me, Dave, you know, we put a ton of work into our PDP professional development program, how we nurture and grow our employees. You know, frankly, it still isn't that great. Do you know why? And I go, yeah, I do. I know why. And then she says, uh, will you tell me? I said, no, I won't. And she goes, that's kind of crummy, you know, and I kind of go, no, no, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to show you. Bias to action. So during the day, the day goes along, and then we do that Odyssey plan thing. And everybody's really digging into it, and they're talking about it, you know. And I holler across them and go, hey, Jane. She goes, what? And I go, it's three, not one. It's three, not one. Because there's more than one of you in there. The amount of work we do that implicitly claims there is one optimal answer to your life. You know, have you figured it out yet? Who says it's it? When's the last time somebody asked you, have you, figured the, have you figured them out yet? Have you got the short list of incredibly viable alternatives between which you probably can't possibly discern a better or a worse from which you will in fact make the best choice you possibly can? How's that going for you? Who's heard that question? But that's who you are. So if we're right on the human-centered design piece, that the human empathy is that you are potentially more than one lived expression of the fullness of your character and your identity, then there isn't one of you. There's a bunch of you. And one of the reasons you never really buy that I'm doing it is because there isn't an it. There's a them. I'm going to pick an it from them. So if, I, if the systems we use with people, either corporately or educationally, better reflect the reality of who they are, their confidence in the answer goes up. It just comes up again and again and again. So the big reframe there is there is no right answer. There are lots of good answers to who you are as a person. <clears throat> so prototype, prototype, prototype. So again, the absolute cardiopulmonary system of design thinking, according to Dave anyway, other designers will argue that it's really defined, you know. Uh, but I think prototype is really the point. Uh, it's an empirical process. We know that we don't know what we're doing. We have to do this empirically. We're going to go try stuff, get some feedback, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it artfully, empathetically, all kinds of those things. Uh, but that's the core part of it. And that's, that's why, you know, Dave and Tom will say, fail often to succeed sooner. And their last book was Creative Confidence, which is about self-agency and self-efficacy, exactly what Rick was talking about earlier. So that's the core of this thing. And I think it's why it works. <clears throat> so what are the learning goals? We d this, this is the goal as stated of the students. Integrate your education with your hopes and dreams, not jumping. The, um, <clears throat> you know, this is like, yes, um, you know, tools in a framework to allow you to position yourself in the world, put, you know, find a place in the world to be, locate yourself, you know, and do so with practices you can use lifelong. That's what we're trying to teach you. Another way we put it is that the goal is not that you'll have an epiphany, you'll find your passion, and you'll have the plan for your life. So that is not what we're about. If you bump into that, if that happens, that's great but by no means do we promise that. We're very clear that this isn't what we're selling. Another way we put it is to enable conscious competency in life and vocational wayfinding. We make the case that you can learn how to be good at this stuff. We do not know the answers to your life, but you can be more competent at how to find them and how to live into them. So if I do, you know, as a former management consultant, I get nervous if I don't do a two by two matrix at some point. Um, and oversimplify the problem. So I can be an unconscious, incompetent, not even be aware that I suck at something. Um, I can be an unconscious, competent, the natural, right? Um, I can be conscious, incompetent. I know I'm no good at jumping because fast twitch muscles don't really happen in my family. Um, or I can be a conscious, competent, somebody who knows they're good at what they do and why. And we argue that a conscious competency is an advantage over an unconscious competency because you can adapt, you can teach others, you can, you can be more flexible, and you, you just get to turn closed captioning on and enjoy the fact that you get it. And if you do that over time and develop mastery, you actually become an intuitive competent. You don't have to think about it, but you can access it if you want to. So that's, we're trying to enable students to have a conscious competency in this life wayfinding step. One of the number one things we hear back from students two, three, four, five years later is they call in and say, guy, thanks so much, Dave and Bill or whomever they took it from. I'm not teaching the class anymore. I'm on the road talking about it. Um, and they say, because I was talking to my friends in my graduating class, and they're struggling. A lot of them hit the wall. They thought that was going to be the great first job. They thought they were going to love it in China, and it's not going as they had in mind. And they're going, oh my god, I guess I blew it. This isn't it. I made a mistake, because I should have known. It seemed like a good idea at the time, and it wasn't. Those are all false, by the way, um, usually. Um, and now I don't know, and, and I thought I did it right the first time, and I don't think I'm any smarter about it now, so i got to make a change, and I don't even trust the person in charge of that, which is me. 
and our students call back and kind of go, I notice I don't feel that way. I'm really happy I don't feel that way. Thank you that I don't feel that way. You know, I, 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 it's not just that I feel that way, but I actually know that I know how to navigate forward in my life. And I'm trying to help my friends do the same thing. You know, phew, that's better than not. So that's, that's the thing we're trying to do. The results, uh, first of all, the evaluation data, do the students like it? The red bars are us, the brown are the engineering norms. Engineering teaches pretty well at Stanford. Um, and in fact, I think if you're getting lower than fours, you're in real trouble. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but we tend to max out. You know, to do stu guess why? Um, little secret, why do students like my class? You get two units in your favorite topic, you. Um, you know, whose favorite thing isn't themselves and what they're doing, so you literally get rigorous engineering credit to learn methodology to be better at you. This is not a hard sell. Okay. Um, now, the research results are we had two PhD studies done with us. We'd love to do more. I haven't got enough funding to actually buy PhDs. If I could afford to buy some PhDs, I could have as many as I want because this is hot stuff. Um, but out of the School of Ed or out of the School of Psychology, we do have people who come our way. We've got uh, two PhDs done with us to date, uh, sort of a half of one being worked on right now. The results, the first one focused on this issue, what are the outcomes? And the first one, uh, the, the results were threefold. Um, an increase in career self-efficacy, and it's hard to see the numbers there. So the, the class members are the blue line, the purple line are the people who signed up for the class but couldn't get in because we thought, well, gee, maybe all we're doing is selecting the students who will grow through this on their own. The course has nothing to do with it. We just picked the self-aware people, you know, um, and the people who could care less. Um, and it turned out, so if you took the class uh, as measured on self-efficacy, particularly on the, on the dysfunctional belief reframes and what have you, my ability to believe I can do things in the world and navigate my own future successfully, if you take the class, you feel a lot better. If you wished you'd taken the class, you'd get a little better, but not much. Um, and the same thing is about true for the non-applicants. So there's a big statistical jump in um, confidence and self-efficacy. Then dysfunctional beliefs is really interesting because they actually had a list of 14 ones, not the same ones we use. Um, they came out of organizational psychology. Um, and if you took the class, and these are mostly, again, seniors um, getting close to graduation, um, then your, beliefs, your belief in things that don't help you drops. If you didn't care at all, and you didn't even sign up for the class, you were just a random student in the study, you know, you probably got a little dumber. You know, you signed up for a few more dysfunctional beliefs as you headed toward graduation. If you are one of the people who wanted to take the class and couldn't get in, in other words, you're thinking about it, you're paying attention, you're like, you're not going around going, ah, it'll work out, I don't know, I'm not really sure. That's not you. You're kind of like, how do we do this? What's really going on? What, are, what should I be doing in my life? That's, that's who you are, and you're not getting any help from us or other people, you're just on your own your belief in dysfunctional beliefs shoots up. You get way dumber as you approach graduation. Why? Because you have to believe something. You can't afford not to think something. And what are you going to do? You're going to grab from the culture around you. You're swimming in these ideas. They must be true. Um, then the novel ideators, we, because we teach ideation, you know, it turns out in terms of a couple of tests you can do on an aptitude basis on sheer volume, just volume, not quality, um, you can have, you'll have twice as many ideas if you take the class. So that's, those are real results. The second study was more qualitative in nature. It was about formation and moral issues. It was looking at um, personal growth initiative or agency in, in, uh, described as a particular attribute study, work development striving competence. So this is a very Dweckian kind of thing. Um, and he also looked at moral reflection. But on the first one, um, big jump up with the intervention participants in terms of the ability, how would I strive to create my, my work competency and will it succeed? Uh, it's a pretty comparable result. On the reflection moral alignment, that's just a correlation. There's a high correlation between doing the reflection exercises, we do a lot of reflection stuff, and being able to identify, am I morally aligned, what we call coherent. So your consciousness of your degree of coherence goes up if you formally reflect. Who knew? Um, you know, so that turns, we, we proved the obvious there because we do a lot of it. Uh, and then the last thing, which I'm actually perfectly happy about, the meaning in life quotient had no immediate effect. You don't feel more meaningful just because you're better at it. You feel more meaningful because you're better at it, applied, put you in a place where you're living more meaningfully. Thinking about being meaningful and thinking you might be able to pull off being meaningful doesn't make you meaningful. It makes you feel a little better, but you actually want to create the outcome. So our class doesn't create the outcome yet, um, so people are still applying it. So those are the formal research results. We're in the workplace, um, the people, the HR people who evaluate this kind of stuff, and you people are probably smart about this, I'll just let you read. Um, this is what an organization who worked with us found uh, in terms of professional development. 
These people were mostly mid-30s. You know, and shifts of even 0.6 on a five-point Likert scale, they think are pretty interesting. So lastly, what did we learn? I'm just going to give you a list, and then we're going to take some questions, and we have time for a, um, a panel on purpose. Um, so from students, what did we learn? In fact, I thought about a bunch more as Rick was talking earlier today. Uh, that's, that's a bunch of our students. Um, so first of all, expect students to treat each other wonderfully. I mean, you know, we forced you to talk to strangers about your impact maps. Um, we do that kind of thing all the time. We put people in small groups that get not uh, pretty, talk about serious things, not necessarily hugely divulgent things. They might be divulgent, uh, but certainly very serious things that matter. <clears throat> and they really treat each other well. It's, it's one of the great joys of doing this work is to see how much people want to help one another become their better selves. Um, freshmen are not seniors who are not PhDs. Um, the work we do when the undergraduate ed organization came to us and said, hey, we love the way you're helping seniors graduate into the world and PhDs graduate into the world. You know, um, how about helping freshmen arrive? Couldn't you design your experience as an education, not just design what you do with your education in the world? And we kind of go, sure. Um, you know, we tend to say yes. Um, Boy, was that a lot of trouble. Um, it turned out uh, it's a very different task, um, and what's going on with freshmen and with seniors and with PhDs is, is really quite different. I won't go into why. Um, but the first thing is pain, watch out for what venture capitalists will tell you about painkillers versus vitamins. So you walk up to a Stanford, you know, spring junior or winter senior, and you go, so Susan, so graduation's coming. I know, I know. Have you got it figured out yet? No, I really don't. You know, would you like some help with that? Yes, that'd be great. Um, you know, because they're suddenly realizing that, you know, this thing they've been really good at called school is over. What I call the decision explosion, you know, happens and they suddenly realize they can do anything they want. Now, you can keep signing up for that, you know, South Park cartoon and go to grad school and get a PhD and then get a postdoc and then go into research. I mean, you can, you, you can get to about 70 before you actually have to do something other than just win the school game. Um, but once you realize that's not it and then it's up to you, um, that's kind of a brain detonating reality. So the seniors are very motivated. In fact, our first pilot was in the spring and I went to the, the career center guy that helped fund it and he, even though know, it wasn't just about career, and he, I said, Lance, this is crazy. You know, the graduating seniors have got this all figured out. Nobody needs to take this class in the spring. He goes, oh, you're gonna have plenty of students. You know? <laughs> and trust me, and, and our spring class is the most attentive. <laughs> like, you're graduating soon. I know, I know. And we'll be covering this in week three. I need it by 4 p.m. I'm talking to a guy. Could you tell me now? You know, so I mean, the spring students are really motivated. Um, and, um, but, the, oh, so, but that's, that's painkillers. Now, with a freshman, you go up to a freshman student, you know, how's it going in Stanford? Oh, it's going great. You know, are you super stressed? Yes, I am, but I thought that was normal, so I don't mind. I just take more Ritalin, it's okay. Um, that's a huge issue. I don't mean to joke about it. Um, and, uh, in fact, the, the mantra of the designing your Stanford class is learning how to get more out of, not cram more into your Stanford experience. That's our mantra. You know, and there's a picture of a pearl opening and a picture of a guy jumping out of a suitcase trying to get the damn thing closed. Um, don't be this guy. You know, don't stay up all night on Ridley and try to cram more in. But the, but the vitamin for the freshman and the sophomore is, you know, I, th I think it's going fine. Hey, how would you like Stanford to be a little better? Okay. You know, would that be great? Sure. You know, um, so it's, in fact, the most common feedback coming out of the freshman class is, gosh, I got more out of this than I thought I would. Expectations are relatively low. So, you know, what, you know, if I got a severe headache, you know, please do you have any Excedrin migraine? I really want that. You know, the painkiller business is about 5x the, the, the vitamin business. Vitamin business is a multi-billion dollar industry, but it pales by comparison to painkillers. What happens if I don't get my Excedrin? My life is over. What happens if I don't take my vitamin C today? Well, I guess it's going to be Wednesday. You know, um, you know so, so if you got that kind, that's a vitamin. And so um, depending which constituency you're working with and what question you're asking, knowing the difference between offering people a vitamin and a painkiller is huge. Um, PhDs are in substantial, I know we're in undergrad land here at Owen, but boy, the most unserved population are PhDs. We keep acting like they've got it all together and they don't. Um, design it, run lots of prototypes, never stop. Apply, you know, if you're gonna teach design class, you gotta keep designing it. Because we walk our talk, this makes me crazy, we brief for half an hour to an hour every single module we teach with our teaching team every single time we teach it, and we debrief every single module we teach every single time we teach it for about a half hour. It's a ton of work, which means we come up with changes constantly. I have terabytes of variations of the same modules. 
Um, it's a huge pain in the butt, frankly, but it's absolutely crucial. <clears throat> um, elective only required is a disaster. Completion credits even. So um, absolutely do not make these kind of courses required. Uh, it's a long story I won't bore you with right now, but you know, you make somebody want to design their life. It's not just that they'll have a bad time. They'll make sure everybody else does too. Like if I'm not, you know, because what happens is I pull back and I go deconstructive, like as opposed to the question was, you know, so how did you feel about these different places on the impact map? Where's the, where's the tension for you? And you're supposed to speak in the first person active voice. You, and you don't, want to, you don't want to answer the question. But you're a smart Stanford student. You figured out how to play the game of school. So what do you do? You go third party passive voice deconstructive. Well, I think this is a really interesting way to look at this question. I notice what you guys are talking about are these values and so on. I'm not sure that's really where I'm coming from. You know, and then all the other little really, really, really well-trained, you know, school winners unconsciously recognize like, oh, 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 not safe. Okay, me too. And you can literally hear the heads of the turtles popping into the shells around the room. You know, you know they all go down and nobody's playing. And we're all going deconstructive like it's done. We're, it's game over. Um, so watch out for the required thing. It doesn't work. And even completion credits, at one point we were invited to apply to become a creativity fulfillment requirement um, in the undergraduate uh, environment at Stanford. And Bill and I talked about it for a long time and turned down the opportunity because even just taking it for the easy units to get that design credit um, maybe wasn't the reason to be in the room. We knew we'd get more students with that. There's no question we'd get more students. Um, and you probably could convert them from just looking for easy units to actually becoming more transformed people, but we just didn't, we just didn't want to engender the risk. Um, clearly working groups, you can't, I mean, the student groups, you can't do this alone. Um, let former students facilitate. We were resource limited for years. Uh, in terms of the people who facilitated the small groups, and students said, we can do this. All we need to do have, is have taken the class. We're going to be good enough to help our peers. In fact, we're better at it than you because we understand them better than do you. We said, prove it. They said, fine. We did two prototypes. They were right. We haven't had a resource problem since. So we no longer turn students away. Uh, we use students as staff. They do a great job. Um, make it real. You can't fake this stuff. Um, watch boundaries. Stick to your contract. Don't overshoot or overstep. That, that, that's a white paper. Um, um, I teach at a secular, inclusive institution. We regard all points of view. We are vigilant about our inclusivity. Um, our construct is design thinking. There are points of efficacy we could probably do that I don't necessarily think are beautifully supported as a design thinking implementation, and I won't go there. Um, so there, we, we leave good things undone by staying within the boundaries of the justification of the work we do, the stuff that we think the majority of students can respond to appropriately. It's not that we're terrified of offending anybody. I offend people all the time. Um, but we want to be very cautious about this thing. We're in, in an institutional environment, and we don't forget that. Our number one problem with both students and volunteer helpers is wanting to do too much. We need to do this too, we need to do this. They really need, oh, they may need that, but their need is not your ordination. Here's who we are, here's what we can do, here's the gift we're giving. It's making things a lot better than it was before. We leave this campground better than we found it. Don't try to go play, don't suffer the Icarus effect. Don't overshoot, don't overstep. Um, it's all about the details. Lots of all-nighters. Um, beware instructor hypocrisy. You start teaching this stuff, you have never had a chance to be a hypocrite like this. You know, my wife constantly says, uh-huh, there's this class at Stanford. You should take it. <clears throat> I hear it's really good. Um, and, you know, and students are very precise in their observation. You know, if you're walking around not walking your talk, you're in some serious trouble. So if you want to sign up to teach this stuff, better have your coherency act together. And this is incredibly gratifying, fun work to do. You know, so a lot of teachers will say, and I think this is probably not true at all, and you know, you know, you never really know if you're making a difference and you're out there and you're teaching, and you're doing the best you can for your, you're just giving into your students and giving it. But every now and then, you know, one comes back and says, gosh, you know, Dr. Smith, that really man. So I just love those. I've got a little drawer here. I've got five of these notes here. They really get, I get six of those a day. I mean, selfishly speaking, because we're talking about these issues and because we're enabling people to do stuff that matters to them, this matters to them. You know, if you're looking for gratifying work, come on down, this is really killer. Um, from colleagues, because we've been working in some other schools getting started now, um, respect that this could be hard to get started. 
depending, and, you know, Olin would be easy because, you know, pedagogically and paradigmatically, we're always in alignment. That's not true a lot of places. Be smart, opportunistic, and incremental. Start small. It's much better to start small successfully and go slow than shoot for the moon and fail. Once you shoot for the moon and fail, you've got a, oh, the whole wrong patina on the whole idea. Um, and maybe not here, but most places I've been, there's somebody who wants you to fail. Don't, don't give them the satisfaction. Um, every place is different. Prototyping is not running a pilot. We've noticed in trying to work with people who know design thinking but haven't really done design thinking, because the, the, the former group is bigger than the latter group, um, one organization I'm thinking of in particular, and we prototyped this, and, 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 and what they weren't doing was prototyping to learn. They weren't completely failure immune yet. They were just using the word, and what they thought they were doing was piloting a program they wanted to run. A prototype is literally a prototype. You may discover from that not a single good idea resides there. Never go there again. That's a fabulous outcome. Like, oh gosh, I thought we're, we're not gonna get to run it. Oh, you've already decided what you're doing and now you're just proving yourself right. That's not a design prototype, that's a pilot. That's a pilot of a program you're already trying to commit to. You know, I really hope this goes well so we can get the funding and grow it. Who decided to grow it? I mean, you really gotta buy into this prototype thing. Um, work in team is preferably cross-functional, involve students whenever you possibly can, and once again, caring educators are incredibly wonderful people. The people we get to work with, both at Stanford and elsewhere, who care deeply about student lives and want to invest and want to be clever and efficacious are just fabulous people. I mean, it's a really, I got the coolest job on the planet. Um, so this is really good work. Um, with that, a couple of minutes of questions before we jump into Rick's panel on purpose. So what I, here's the way I handle questions. I don't, I don't, don't do questions the same either. Um, I'll take a bunch of questions. It's true there are no dumb questions, but some are better than others. Um, <laughs> and they're better because they might be more to the point or I might have more interesting things to say. Don't you hate it? You know, you're in the Q&A thing and the first question comes up and frankly it's obvious and the speaker, because she knows the answer, gives a nice long answer, everybody already knew like you're wasting my time. Let me see what might go together. Let's talk about, um, We'll talk about the grit thing. Um, so we don't we don't teach um, we don't teach grit or mindset per se. Um, we um, a lot of we actually. By the way, if you look at our lesson plans, our lesson plans are incredibly. So here's the here's the lesson plan for for today. It's broken down by the minute. There's 12 different modules that you just went through. You know, three minutes of this, two minutes of that, seven minutes of that. Everything we do is like that. We have terabytes of this stuff. And the, the long spreadsheet of a lesson plan that we currently run off of a, a disastrous Excel workbook um, has um, the time allocation, the module, the steps, the role who's leading, the role for the section facilitator who also has a whole different guide sheet, you know, the materials required, and then what are the learning goals, what are the outcomes, and what are the commentary that we've learned on previously. So every single module we teach, we actually have a learning goal. Now, we don't always adhere to it, but we're trying to be that explicit. Um, so we're, we're never unintentional. We're, we're, never make, we're, we're never guessing. We might be wrong, but we're never guessing. Um, so on the grit thing, we, uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our lesson goals and outcomes are not taught. One of our lesson goals is to learn active listening. You'll never see that term on a slide. You'll never see that term on a curriculum, but we create very specific rubrics or how people debrief conversations. We do that over and over again, and regularly students come back to us and tell us, you know, one of the things that I really, you know, what I really noticed by the end of the quarter is um, the way we talked in section, I think that's kind of important. I got better at it. I really appreciate that. Oh, cool. I'm glad you picked that up for free. We worked really hard to make sure you would. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, you don't tell them everything you're teaching them. Um, so the grit thing we build into do it again, do it again, do it again. And frankly, just go do it. You know, go out in the world and talk to strangers, go out in the world and do these things, talk to people you haven't heard before, role play stuff. So we invest in a lot, this is a really good example. There are a lot of things we invest in process-wise, but not explicitly. Um, which gets me to the baked into the core a little bit. So could this be baked into core curriculum? Uh, sure. I mean, it can be, this, this can be cultural. Um, what, we got asked by the head of undergraduate advising after we'd had a couple of years of success, finally, and by the way, the growth of designing your Stanford is like this. Really slow, linear, organic growth. DYL went like this, you know, and, and it's been hovering around 
you know, somewhere between 10 and 17 percent penetration of each each graduating year, depending on the year, comes and goes. Bill and I have a long running argument about what's the maximum penetration. If we did our job brilliantly, including other forms of delivery that don't take two units of your transcript time, which is a ton, uh, um, where would we max out? I mean, we're undoubtedly not teaching some students we could and should, and, and if we solved all that problem theoretically, what's the max? I think it's you know, 18 to 25 percent. Bill thinks it's 50. I happen to be right, um, but that's okay. The, um, uh, but you have to answer the question, how far can you go with this? How many people, frankly, are ready to be that intentional about their lives? You know, um, that's, that's, a, that's a bit, an interesting question. Um, thoughtful, you know, change is inevitable, growth is optional. Thoughtfulness seems to be you know, not all that popular these days. Um, and uh, so you have to decide where your students are on that, on that issue. So core curriculum wise, I, I would be nervous to put stuff explicitly in that you weren't confident lots of students would want to participate in, because it's gonna ruin it for everybody. So I'd make it core in a way that allowed an opt-in uh, that was self-managing. Um, <clears throat> and I think it has a lot to do with what's going on in the culture. So I think you know, if we, we were asked by these undergrad ed people to take the design of your Stanford learnings and move this into a peer advising experiment there are questions we'd like to help a lot of freshmen, particularly people who are doing pre-major advising, you haven't declared yet, so you, your advisor isn't from your department because you haven't got one yet, so you've got this other kind of an advisor. That relationship, pre-major advising, is kind of broken, has been apparently forever everywhere, they tell me. Uh, it's really hard to do. So how could we fix that? Well, we could, we could improve peer advising. And so we, we put together a whole program to do this kind of thing. Um, and that had to do with making it, and if it went, it would have been more available across all freshmen could do it. It's still an opt-in, but it would have been a playing around with making it a core function of new student orientation and freshman programming. Um, and after a successful uh, two-year pilot, you know, the undergraduate aid department decided not to proceed. You know, and, we, and, we, and we talked to them about what the, uh, it's a long, discussion is what the issues are. Um, but determined it was tricky enough, um, the, the approach that one, that one idea we had was tricky enough that making it really last uh, over time without wandering off and becoming either boring or inappropriate was just not worth the expense and would have been expensive. Um, so I think when you're talking about baking into core, it depends on what your core is, how you teach it, what the culture of the organization is. I think with design-based learning already being true and wanting to look both at big issues and small micro issues as a default way of being just awake and with a three-digit IQ at Olin, it'd be a piece of cake to bake it into your core. Just make sure you do it smart. And I would absolutely, well, any, back to overshoot, um, you know, again, the, the, my, my problem student in the class you know, so one of our facilitators will come to us and say, we got a problem with Anna, what's going on? Well, she's just scaring everybody, you know, because Anna's been waiting for this conversation for three years, you know, finally we're talking about meaning making, you know. You know, she wants to do primal scream, you know, let's all take our clothes off and just scream, it's going great. You know, it's kind of like, because you know, she'll ask this one simple question, well, gee, what do you think about your impact map? Well, it's really important, and she's just going for it, and she's operating at a level of intensity that the other students aren't at yet. And she's scaring them, she's just flat scaring them. You know, um, and so, you, honey, you got to back down. You know, no, it'd be great if everybody was operating at your level. You're taking this very seriously, but people aren't. You know, you're just in a minority. And the same would be true of some teachers. So the overshoot, the first overshoot is just intensity. I mean, I care about this so much more than my students think I do. Um, because it's like, you know, um, hey, whatever. If this helps, fine. Up to you. You gotta go, you know. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not faking it that bad, but it's it's really light. Um, if if you need them to want this from you, it's like bad parenting, right? You know, if you really need them to get it, they won't take it from you. Um, they uh, rightly so, they, they, you know, because now it's about you. You care so deeply. Them getting what you get is now. I'm fulfilling my need to help you. This is the in the helping professions. This is the invariable risk if it becomes about me. So you have to really get clear that it's not about you. Even when it's not about you, but it looks like it's about you, they're getting a false negative on you being too into it, you're still screwed. You have to overmanage that. It's a skeptical society right now. And that's not a big issue. Then the other thing is, in for instance, we don't go into um, character formation. We don't go into the dark side. We don't go into dealing with your personal weaknesses. We don't go, there are a bunch of things we, those are real. You know, we don't do leadership stuff. 
There are a bunch of things we could do that we don't. Why? Because frankly, they're either, we think, too edgy in terms of the number of students who will be into it versus not, or they extend the metaphor of how design thinking would respond to it far enough that we've begun to really stretch our legitimate competency. And frankly, a lot of the work we do as students, we get feedback on stuff we didn't teach them. We're trying to get momentum started. We're trying to get trajectories begun, not destinations landed on, if that makes sense. So if we start you down the path of coherency, that might lead to the formation of purpose. But we don't, you don't write a purpose statement in our class. We hope you become more purposeful, but we don't force you to get to that outcome. So the, and we think that's still the right call. So that's what the overshoot stuff is about. Uh, why the old guys? Um, the facilitators facilitate the conversation, they can't teach it. So teaching is one thing, delivering the material uh, is one thing, being able to, to help other people have the conversation is another, so that's just a different level. Um, if we, we have grad students actually who've worked with us enough that actually do co-teach with us. So we've expanded the teaching team. Uh, one of the reasons getting teachers in this class is hard to come by is because it's a double learning. I th my guess is um, even hard science teachers would say the same thing, but certainly in this methodology stuff or this life formation stuff, you have to get the content twice. First, you have to get it comprehensively. You have to, you have to get it here. And then you have to get how they get, you have to get how it lands in a life, you have to get how it arrives in a mind, you have to get the context of, and if they believed me, what would they then do? And you can teach more effectively when you're no longer thinking about the comprehension of the content at all. You, be, you can do that intuitively. You really have mastered the content. And now you can focus on what's happening in front of you. Um, so it takes a while because the truth is we do, Bill and I do audibles all the time. We do real-time calls on double down on this, drop this, you know, we, we, we do that all the time. Now our younger teachers don't, they stick to the curriculum more directly, but it takes a while to get to the place where you can have mastery in this stuff, as it does in any field, but certainly when you move into this kind of stuff, it's, it's, it's very clear. And then I think I probably should be stopping any second here. Internationals and PhDs. You know, this is, I really thought a lot of this was gonna be very idiomatic culturally. It hasn't. All the places we've been that have been highly international um, have received it well. Now again, it's self-selecting. Nobody walks in the room that doesn't want to design their lives, right? Um, now there are educational systems. You know, if you're in England, you're in India. You know, early tracking, nobody moves. You know, I mean, teaching, designing your life, you know, at IIT in India would be really hard. <laughs> Just wouldn't, wouldn't make sense. Now, give me an IIT grad, that's really helpful. And a bunch of those guys, uh, those people. Um, so I think you have to decide where things make sense. Um, but the, so I'd say there have been institutional cultures, educationally, that have been, that are less receiving than others by quite a bit. I would say in terms of just plain cultures, you know, as the East versus West or, or Africa or whatever it might be, that has, that has had less um, impact on receivability based on the anecdotal data we have of a couple of thousand students over 10 years uh, than I thought it would have been. Um, and and, and the, frankly, the reception of the book, I'll get why the book, um, has completely astonished me. Um, and I think it's because, um, you know, the poetess's question, what will you do with the rest of your one wild and wonderful life, is pretty compelling to most people that are at a level of autonomy and have some freedom. If you're in massive oppression, that's not your question. Is this an elitist issue? No, but it is an issue for people who have some degree of freedom over how they choose to spend their time and their energy. If you have no degrees of freedom, this is, you know, we're dealing with, you know, restoration, not design. That's a different problem. Uh, we don't pretend to be that. Um, that comes up a lot. So I think the international thing um, is, is pretty good. The PhD thing is just, uh, you gotta understand the culture they're coming from in terms of what they have intellectual permission to believe is true. By far the hardest students are PhDs in the humanities, um, much harder than the sciences, um, because the, the, the reigning ethos in that field is skepticism. You know, um, and, and, and the reigning ethos in design is optimism. It's in there somewhere. You know, so that, that, you know, they're very skeptical of people who aren't skeptical. You don't seem very skeptical. That bothers me. You know, um, so we, we kind of offend them just by showing up and being cheerful. Um, the um, some of them, not all. Um, how young can you go? We don't know. Uh, we get, we're getting pushed into high school a lot. We get asked a lot about can you do this in high school? Um, and somebody's probably going to think of that. We haven't done it yet. I think it probably. I'm not sure I do it in in kindergarten. Um, but I'd change my questions to kindergartners. I would fundamentally reframe the question. Now, what do you want to be when you grow up? Single answer, fill in the blank, get it right, don't be wrong. 
um, as opposed to what are the kinds of things that you find interesting? Who are the grown-ups that you find fun to watch? That's a better question than what do you want to be when you grow up? That's the beginning of the wrong framework. Anyway, so those are some answers to some questions. There are many more, uh, and certainly some big ones have to do with purpose, which Rick is going to lead us into now. Thank you for your time. You've been great.